through topic by topic. Today we're going to have a look at NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, and how we can use that to identify some chemicals, and we can then use other techniques such as mass spec and infrared spectroscopy to give us a full picture of what molecule we're actually looking at. So we can use this as an analytical tool. My age, I suppose, means that when I started out, NMR didn't really exist, especially for students. We did have at my university an NMR machine. We were told we had an NMR machine, and that's about as near as we got to it. But nowadays, they are, well, not that cheap, but they're still readily available. There are two sorts of NMR machines, carbon NMR, carbon-13 NMR, and then there is also proton NMR. And we'll have a look at both of these to sort of get some idea. So let's start with what is nuclear magnetic resonance and get some idea about that before we move on. Right, OK, so let's start with this basic idea that what we've got is some sort of nucleus and basically this nucleus is sitting there quite happily it's a carbon 13 let's say and it's got from what we know then a sort of a a spin and what we can do is we can pass some energy in the form of radio waves here to flip the spin. So we normally put this into a large magnetic field. So we've got this in a large magnetic field and it's spinning in a particular direction. So a magnetic field of some sort. We apply a radio frequency to this and what we're going to see is this molecule will now spin the other way. So we can see here the atom changing. First of all the atoms align themselves to the magnetic field. Energy is then used to flip this alignment and as this happens we can see a change and this is recorded in something like an NMR and there we've got a picture of some sort of NMR of something we'll have a look at what it is in a moment we've got to put our substance however in something that's not going to sort of ruin it and what we're going to use is a special chemical which is called TMS. So this TMS, tetramethyl silane, and that means it's got a silicon at the centre, and we have a CH3, a CH3, a CH3, I think I suppose I ought to make that one stick out, and one at the back, and that is tetramethylsilane. And what we do is we make that equal to a zero shift. And we are going to compare then everything to this tetramethylsilane. So if we give this a value of 0 ppm, then everything, all the other peaks, are placed on the x-axis and they compare to this. Now why do we use TMS? Well, because it contains both carbon and hydrogen, so we can use this for carbon NMR and for proton hydrogen NMR. It produces just one sharp signal 
because here it's got one carbon atom here, but they're all identically placed, so we get just one position for our carbon-13 spike. This stuff is non-toxic, so that's quite a good feature. It's got a low boiling point, it's volatile, so we can actually remove it from the sample if we need to. And it's pretty inert, because the last thing we want to do is get this to react with the substance we're actually playing with and trying to examine. So, what is an NMR and what is this shift that I'm talking about? Well, we've got two sorts. We've got proton NMR and we've got carbon-13 NMR. And we can see different sort of things with them. So let's draw out a simple NMR. And we'll have a look at one of these and we might get one peak. Now this we would call a singlet. Then we might get other peaks. We might get another peak here one's going to be slightly higher and these are going to be slightly lower and here we've got a triplet so we're getting different shapes of peaks and they mean different things we can also have perhaps a quartet and this is typically going to look something like that. So this we see in a proton NMR. In the other type, the carbon-13 NMR, we would see other peaks which are typically just at certain positions. And we measure these in ppm, parts per million. Now, coming with these things, there are little, often little booklets. And I've got one here, which my son had from his university. And it gives us things like infrared spectroscopy details of what's going on. But we can also have proton NMR scales and we can look at different numbers for different groups much like we had with the infrared. And we can have chemical shifts for different things like carbon-carbon double bonds. And then we've got all the ones for the benzenes so there are little booklets like this which are really useful. They're called spectroscopy tables. And normally you get part of this given to you in an examination. We'll look at that a little bit later. So let's have a look at one of these to start with. Now we know we've got proton NMR and we've got carbon NMR. So let's have a look at some of these and we'll see what we've got. We'll see a little bit about how it works. Now today I've brought a guest in and my guest here is my son, who happens to have played with NMR quite a lot, and he's taken um, little machines like this out into the field, haven't you? Taken, you've been in what they have there 
Kingston University had their lab in the lorry and it had a portable NMR machine. When I first met an NMR machine, it was enclosed in its own little building. Well, they still are, but that's a different story. Why? Why, why would it be put in a separate building? Because it's a large magnet, and and you know mo most things are quite happy you near know, plastics, but most things are built you know made of steel and iron, and, and well, it, it's a magnet and it's a large magnet, and you, you've been through the sort of like the uh, you know the airport scanners and they bleep at you. Well, instead of bleeping at you, how about they sort of just attract you? And, you know, almost slap your wrist against things. I've seen um, pictures, um, films, where someone's gone in for a, a CAT scan and for um, the other type, um, oh, one of these NMR scans. They don't call it NMR in, in there though, do they? They give it a different name. Yeah, they just call it magnetic re uh, resonant imaging because if you say the word nuclear, uh, <laughs> everybody gets a bit scared, but the principle is exactly the same. So that's why they're called MRI machines, so they don't quite get sort of quite as upset then. Now, this MRI machine, I've seen people have their sort of, they go in with these um, sort of plates in there with screws, and I've, I've heard horror stories of these things being pulled out of their flesh by the strength of the magnet. So. Are these NMR machines using the same sort of strength of magnets? Oh, absolutely. They're the same, you know, it's about, um, you know, because it has to be for the getting the frequency of the atoms or the molecules at that level, it has to be such high intensity. Okay, so we've got an enormous magnet, and I know from your horror stories you've told me that you have to take your watch off. Um, you can take your phone in, that's optional. If you, if you want it uh, to be turned into a brick, that seems to be sort of a, a good way of um, doing it. Doing it, you know, silly things like jewellery is uh, one of those things where they have problems of, and that, you know, wedding rings especially, they just get blam slammed in and then suddenly wrecks a machine. And wrecks a £20,000 machine, you are not happy, or even better, the whole department or whoever owns the machine isn't happy with you. So you took out uh, this lab and a lorry so it had a small NMR machine I assume something called a, you told me a portable NMR machine how big was it what, what, what sort of scale? I think of a large briefcase essentially because unfortunately you still need that magnetic mass to actually do the NMR and it, it's not as precise and you know it's not as good but as a sort of tool to go out and show people what NMR is like you know that, that's what it's really designed for rather than being that analytical sort of ultra precise measurement or analysis. Right so these things are not probably as accurate as some of the big ones in the universities but it could still identify substances and these things can get taken around to schools and what you had things like ultraviolet spectroscopy uh, infrared spectroscopy even mass spectroscopy you could take around to schools and show them yeah so we were we, I was a part of a project which was basically uh, spec not spec in a box but spec in a uh, briefcase and essentially was that stuff going through and bringing those materials out to show them what these machines are because you just see graphs you know throughout the syllabus and course and it doesn't work you, know, you get to play around and do all the behind the scenes to actually get your data and then you actually analyze it which is what we're coming on to next aren't we yeah so what I would like is a, a little lab and a lorry to just come here and uh, show but unfortunately they don't want to do it just for, for me to sort of show off. But we'll, we'll see. Now, let's have a look at a real NMR and start having a look at. So, uh, I've just popped one up on the screen here. Now, can you talk us through what is this we're actually looking at? Well, 
I can tell you we're looking at is this proton NMR or is this carbon so looking NMR? at the baseline the scale I can tell you it's proton by the fact it's a small amount of shift you know using small numbers whereas you've got um, if I just find here oh, da, 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 da. Yeah. whereas this one you see is carbon and the shifts are a lot bigger so immediately you can spot whether you're looking at a carbon NMR or a proton NMR two ways one by having a look at this shift in parts per million and the other way that I immediately look at these is that I see that we've got either single lines which I expect to see in a carbon-13 NMR or we see these peculiar singlets, doublets, triplets and so on multiplets well not usually doublets but uh, well wow. we uh, we get different things okay so this is the same substance we're looking at here I assume yeah on both so we've got the same substance can you talk us through this is the proton NMR so what can we determine from this proton NMR so we, we haven't got TMS speak but they've been scaled up for TMS so we know that that's fine right so we come along here we know at sort of in between 2 and 1 or in between 2 and 0 so effectively 1 that we've got our peak and it, it's a it's a 3 so that's a triplet so, so about 1 got triplet so if I can record this then I've got uh, let's say a triplet triplet at, at one one ish. PPR so it's about right about yeah. right and then we've got another one which is looks like a, a quad uh, quad pet quadlet it's four whatever it is and that is just below two so probably 1.9 1.8 that's right sort of so I, I could record that one and then finally and then finally at probably well, there's three there's 3.2 so probably 3.3 you've got another uh, triplet so I've recorded those now what actually does this triplet mean well, for that, I'm going to have to borrow a molecule. So, here's our atom, or here's our molecule. Uh, you know, and basically, what we're saying is that if I just take that off, we've got three hydrogens. Let's put this down on the on the thing. Yeah, might be able to see a little bit better. I'll zoom out so we can see better so we've got three hydrogens on this carbon i'm going to move the paper there we are okay so what this means is each hydrogen is actually being flipped you're identified but because there's three of them they are the same on the same point but what happens is because they're next to as one signal another set which is one signal it's sort of each of them have their own depending on where it is in the molecule it's shifting around they, they sort of have their own little frequency and they change a bit which bounces the signal around a bit so it's not sort of like a nice peak it's sort of very uh, muddy in the signal when I, when I was talked about this when I started looking at this NMR they, they talked about basically seeing one molecule from another one you're actually looking at it from the point of view of another molecule or another point yeah so it, it, it's one of those things where sort of it's doing its neighbor which is where it's sort of this n plus one rule comes from and essentially it's looking at one 
one molecule or one section of the molecule is then looking at the adjacent set of signals. You know, it could be its neighbour, it could be left or right of it, you know, up or down, but it's never itself. It's always looking at something else. So if we were to look at this molecule, let's, let's just modify this molecule. Let's make a, a, an alkane then here. So these two would be looking either at that end and that, that end. then at the same time, which causes this sort of like, and we can't tell through symmetry, you can't tell which end you're looking at. So we just sort of go, it's a guess, it's there, it's, it's sort of what's happening. So NMR is just giving us then a whole series of possibilities of what we could have. This, this one's going to have three hydrogens on, this one's going to have two. You know a two's perhaps next to a three, but you don't know where in the molecule that's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely right. It, 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 it's a guessing game. All it gives you is the jigsaw pieces, and then it's up to you to assemble that jigsaw. So let's take a look at one of these things and have a look at and see what we can have a you know, let's just choose a molecule. So what molecule would you suggest we had a look at? Well, let, let's start with a very simple one. So let, let's look at this. Right, so that is propan one ol. Propan one ol, yep. I've got my three carbons that we can see and we've got the OH at the end. So propan one ol. So let's take a carbon NMR of this. A carbon NMR of this. Okay, fair enough. Right, so we've, you know, we've scanned it in the machine and we've come out and we've made this spectra. Okay. And so I've got some different values. I can grab hold of your little booklet here to have a look at. Yeah. And I can call up the spectroscopy tables and see what we've got. What we've got. Yeah, absolutely. This is where I am upsetting him because I've yeah, got to find the right page. Because where everything is annoying. It's nearer the end. So we've got here our shifts, and we can have a look at some of those to see what we've got. Okay, so let's let's look at this and see what we've got. So I can see we've got one peak at. Let's see what those scales are. That's 10, 20, 30, 40. Yes, yeah, about 10 then. So you've got one at 10, probably one at 25. Okay. And then one probably at 60. So I'm just going to record those so I know what we've got. So this is uh, the NMR. This is carbon 13 and... Ooh. One about 10, 10, one about 25, and then one about 60. Okay. So, what is that telling me? So, what can I actually get from this? Can I work out which is which carbon and, and doing what? So, what this graph is telling you is that you've actually got three carbon environments or three different carbon environments which is very an odd very strange phrase because sort of like you think carbon along the chain is the same but because of how the electronegativity works it sort of gets pulled around across the molecule so if you have a electronegative atom at the end all the electronegativity as in the electrons get pulled to the end which means that the end carbon that's furthest away from the oxygen, say, is it's different to the one very closest to that car, uh, that oxygen, just through electronegativity. So they are very much different in their electronic profile, which is actually what NMR is actually looking at. So can we actually 
go and sort of work out which one is is which then so we've got these at 10 25 and 60 what could you do with the tables to work this out so you go and look at the table so I've got the table here let's got the table so you look it in I'm gonna zoom in here and which one do I want to look at so we find sort of roughly of what the scales are so we're looking down here in this column and we are trying to identify where some of them are okay so well we've got one you said around about 60 yeah so you've got some of these but I'm also looking at sort of oh but the can you see the ranges are huge some of these. very large here aren't they sort of so I'm looking at one here that's 52 to, to 27 oh 28 sorry for this one which is this quaternary carbon here and that could be an option there so we, we've got now loads of options and if I just look on the other ones there I can see that some of these have also in this range so we've got an enormous number of things in this range so the carbon's telling us something but we need a bit of help here we need a bit of help and the answer is we're helping via looking at the spectra so as you can see on this one all CHs and all CH CH2s and CH3s right have 48 to 0 so we're looking at spectra we've got 10 and 25 which could account for that. So that suggests we've possibly got here a CH2 and a CH3. A CH3, no problem. So they're in the game. Now that we go up and we sort of go, oh, something's 47 to 60. Now we were estimating that was about 60, but it could be a bit under. So that, that could be a CH3O. CH3O. May not just be that one. We've also got a CH... 2O, which is here I can see 78 to 37, so that's still in our range that we're looking at. So, so now we've essentially got lots of things, possibilities it could be. So, what's next? So, I've done a carbon 13 NMR, I've got some ideas. I can't get the whole story from this, so. Do we go off and do a proton NMR? You, you can, but not in, in the typical exam question. What they actually give you is something known as the empirical formula. Now, that's not the molecular formula, which is the one that tells you exactly. It just tells you how many carbons there are, how many, what the atoms are around them. So, for this one, I might be told it's molecular weight then. So, we've got some idea of our molecular weight of perhaps this substance. Now, we're actually cheating because we know this is propan 1 ol. So, because I know we've got propan 1 ol, then if I just zoom out a little bit, so I know that's going to be CH3, CH2, CH2, OH. So, I can work out here what we've actually got. Um, so, if I know the carb, the, what I'm looking for, can we then use what I know I'm looking for? So I think I've got this. Am I using this NMR then to sort of confirm what I've got in this case? Yeah, it's one of those things, it's just another tool to make sure you've actually worked out what that molecule is and what it is in the spectra and sort of what happens to it. Okay, so propan one ol then, we know what its structural formula is. It's got three carbon atoms. We've got three different environments and we can see those three different environments. Now, once we've got that idea, we've got one carbon here is attached to an alcohol. So we know we've got this type of environment so it's connected to that um, we can see that this you suggested the shift was somewhere between about 50 and 70 for that and so 
that's most likely then going to be this one. So it's somewhere in that range. Then we've also got two other environments and we've got one at 25 and one at 10. Um, have you any ideas which one is likely to be the CH2 and which one's going to be the CH3? Because in the data you've just told me that they're in, in that range up to about 48. Does the NMR give me any hints whether the obviously I've got two different numbers we've got one at 25 and one at 10 have I any way of working out which is which? So the the the, process, the the shift is actually based on the electron density of the entire molecule so it's individual sections of course have either an increased amount of electronegativity or a decrease so an increase of electronegativity means it's being pushed down the spectra to, you know towards the bigger numbers whereas those furthest away from the electronegativity or the in lower down in the shift means they're very closer to the naught because they're not being they're not that sort of intense in the electromagnetic uh, fluctuations that NMR is recording. So what I'm getting from that then is the CH3 is most likely going to be the 10. Most likely to be the 10 leaving the other one the CH2 as most likely being the 25. So that's giving us this sort of ideal idea of what the range is going to be for these. Okay, so that's told us something. We knew something about the molecule and we can use this carbon NMR to work out something about what these could possibly be, but it, it, it's not absolutely confirmed. So we can just use this perhaps to to make predictions. How about if we looked at a different molecule? Now, do you have the spectrum of propan-2-ol? Just so I can compare that. Because I'd expect, if I'm looking at propan-2-ol, and if I just zoom out here, that propan-2-ol, I would expect now my carbon here to see two basically different environments. I would expect it to see a CH3 group and I would expect it to see an OH group. Yes, absolutely right, absolutely right. So, because of how things play in symmetry of the molecule, you can't tell what side you're looking at, or you can tell you it was there. But luckily, carbon-13 has a little thing, is where basically saying, I've got an interesting thing of two sides of the molecule, which means that it's giving me the same signal, but at twice the intensity. And we record that in the carbon spectrum. So looking there, we've got two environments I can see. So you've got two environments but this peak, the one though the lower peak, has got an integral value which is basically sort of a very fancy way of saying this line is twice this line of two. Meaning that this somehow, although lower down, actually got is made up of two environments. So we're, we're looking at then the one at about six, about six, 20 to one, one's about what, 25, and the other one at um, about that's, that's 60 six, and a bit. 60, 60 and a bit, and so 60 25. and 25. So, a similar numbers that we met in the other one, but we've got twice as many CH3s, and our CH3s are located differently than they are in the other molecule. So in the other molecule I had the values of here I've got carbon uh, 20, 
CH3 is at 10, CH2 at 25 and that. In this molecule, if I just draw it out, I've got my CHOH with my CH3 here, my CH3 here. So here I've got my two environments and they are now roughly at 25 each and the other one, the OH, is very similar what to what it was before, it's still at 60. So what you can see from this is that the any carbon that next to an OH is in this realm which is where these spectroscopy tables were built because all the analysis was happening and they were the same results coming up over and over again which means that because of this we can actually build these tables we know that by comparing other molecules the same we can tell that oh it's always going to be that it's always going to shift that way so molecules really sort of have a their spectra is all the same they have the same yeah. Yeah. electronegatively profile in a sense Okay, so we can use then this to sort of determine the numbers of carbon environments and we can look at it to give some idea of what the group is. Is that the limit of what we can do with our carbon-13 NMR at the moment, really? For A level, yes. But we can do a lot of clever things what is known as a depth scan, which essentially tells the difference between uh, different, I say different carbon environments, but the almost what the structural formula of that carbon is, whether it's a, a primary carbon or a secondary carbon, which essentially just means how many bonds that carbon is doing. So if it's a quaternary, or a, a tertiary, sorry, then it's only got three the same atoms and another different or a secondary which is CH2 but that's a, as far as you get okay so that's our first idea looking at carbon 13 NMR let's move over to proton NMR and see what we can discover with some proton NMR now proton NMR then we're looking at either having one hydrogen or two hydrogens or three hydrogens probably on a carbon atom and they're going to be different and they're going to sort of act differently and this thing's called spin-spin coupling yes right okay <laughs> so yeah i did think you might was going to tell me what spin-spin well, coupling was but I, do you want me to go through with that one? Well, so spin pin coupling is, is one of those hard to describe things. It, we, we just know it happens. But essentially what happens is a hydrogen atom is spinning in the molecule and essentially lots of the other hydrogen atoms would like to spin in the same way to it. But of course some of them aren't. You know, we, we know this. Some of them just, just plainly aren't. And so what we can tell is by them sort of spinning the same or opposite way, they sort of cancel or they double the signal out. So essentially it's adding or subtracting a wave, um, you know, destructive waves. Yeah. So why do we get this funny rule with the number of peaks in the splitting pattern is always one more than the number of hydrogen atoms that we've actually got how what why is this true that it, it that there is this n plus one rule so hydrogen in itself won't couple to anything yeah right so it's quite happily spinning along and when it gets a buddy it spins along now in nmr we actually make sure that they're all spinning the same way so essentially if one's flipped up upside down we then flip it up which then causes problems because when they both flip down that one flips back up so there's two different orientations so there's two this. different orientations so basically to equate to that 
is essentially we say, although it's done, the, we flip them both up, or then one's now flipped down, and you know, it's sort of to equate that, we basically say, well, it's done an extra motion, which allows us why it's n plus one, rather than just being the standard n. Okay, so let's have a look at one of these spectra. Uh, we've got one up on the screen here. Now, this is for what substance? Uh, this is for good old propan one ol. So, the one that we've so one had we a look at before, yeah. this propan one ol. Yeah. So, back to our original chemical we were looking at. Yeah, let's have a look at it. Right, and so essentially we can go for, we look at the integral values first. They give a description of basically, once again, how many hydrogens are next to things. So here we've got three hydrogens at sort of one. So that, that tells one. us we've got, because we've got then, we've got a triplet there, yes? We've got a triplet, but the triplet means nothing. It's the integral value, which is a different number. Right, so that's the height. That's the height. So that tells you how many hydrogens are present at that signal. The coupling tells you what's next door, but the integral tells you how many at that precise point. So looking at this, I'm looking at this saying I've got then you've got a, a CH3, three. You've got a CH3, you've got a CH2, and a CH2. Now those two are different heights. Now explain the integral value to me because that that's going to make some sense it, of what we're seeing. So unlike carbon, where the integrals make sense. NMR, proton NMR, the integral doesn't. So essentially, the, the intensity of the peak is not related to, its in to the integral value. So this is intense, you know, whereas this one isn't, but they still share the same integral. And the NMR machine puts out the integral value for you. It just spits it out, you just accept it. So, given an uh, NMR, I'm actually seeing that information presented to me. Okay, so I've got something now with an integral value of 3 and 2 with integral value of 2. So that's telling me that I've got a CH3 group and two CH2 groups. But the two CH2 groups are different. Absolutely right. Now... Looking up those values, then if we go to your book of tables, then here we're looking at proton shifts. Now, this would be done in what TMS as well. This would be done in this. So this would be done in TMS. Or what's the alternative? You've got deuterated. Uh, I say deuterated solvents. Essentially, it's where. Water or is a has got protons, yeah, right, which spin because it's got a proton mass of one. Deuterated essentially is having an extra neutron put into that um, nu uh, nucleus, meaning it's then got a mass of two. You know, nothing changes in the charge and it's all safe, but that mass effectively makes it twice as heavy meaning its spin is a completely different number to other. So it takes it basically right out of the way of what we're actually looking at. So we're looking at stuff that's not deuterated, so therefore we can easily sort of get the idea that this is, this is the only thing that we're actually looking at. All right, so let's have a look at this spectrum and we've got here this is proton NMR let's just zoom in here so we can have a look at some of these proton NMRs and I've got some ideas that I've got uh, a CH3 group connected to uh, this is this, this is where this the integral value so here's the integral values at the top Ah, right, okay. Okay, so this is this is why you, they produce them. So you've got if integral value of 3, integral value of 2, integral value of 1. So essentially you can look through and say, ah, oh, we've got a 3. Okay, and that's happening about 1. So we go through about 1. Oh, so it's only these couple first ones. 
right? Where our integral values are two, they were more closer to do, so they're actually further down here. Okay, so that's then giving me an idea then looking at this one and we're just looking at here propan one ol so what can we see for propan one ol here we can get some idea for propan one ol what we've basically got so we can look at this and we can say that we've got a ch Two, we've got so, a CH3. So, so looking at three, this is a so if this is a integral of three, but this is also a triplet, so this signal is looking next to a CH2 because of n plus one, so we minus down, so that's looking at a CH2. So what we're looking at then in my molecule, then that that first peak, we're looking at this CH3 and it can see a CH2 it next to it. It can see a CH2 next to it, so effectively all we've done is we've built that up so far. Right, then we look at the next one which is the CH2, so we're taking it off, and that can see... So th this is the middle value, okay, so, yeah. So that one, that can see pig force, now that means it's a CH3 is next to it. So, like we did, so first one tells you a CH2 is next to it, the next one tells you there's a CH3 next to it. But that's because it can see the four peaks. That's because it can see the four peaks. But also, or it can see that it's got a quaternary, it's quaternary because it's four. But also adjacent to that, it can also see the other CH2. Okay. Next to it. And then you're left with what's on the attached to the end, which obviously is the OH. Because that, although it does spin, doesn't couple through molecules. Because the oxygen's got nothing to do with it, it can't couple through the chain, or the not chain. Okay, so let's go and have a look at another molecule. So we've looked at propan one ol we've looked at propan 2 ol Let's choose another chemical and go and have a look at that. So, what would you recommend we have a look at? Uh, I think we can look at something a bit more sort of difficult. Let, let, let's look at something, I don't know, it's got a bit more of a... Now, you're using a different, a little nice little website which you showed me, which is nr, nmrdb.org. Now, this seems to be quite a nice little website for doing all sorts of clever things. All so sorts of clever things, yeah, to actually look at. So what I'm here, I'm drawing, I've got a benzene ring, I've just drawn it in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a little chain. I'll just put here a little, another chain. And essentially, I'm going to make that an O. And it's going to complain at me, so I'm actually going to put a, make that something like that. Right? And all that's going to do is spit out his, if I scroll down, here is the spectra, what you actually get. Now, unfortunately, this is a carbon because I was on the carbon page. So that's a carbon NMR. So that's carbon NMR. So it would predict that. Can we? Can you save that molecule to go on to the proton the NMR? No. Fine. Okay. Try so. It does sort of do it. And it sort of does for it, but here we go. Here's the actual spectra, and we've got not many environments because we've got a benzene ring, and so, so each of those will see the benzene in the same way. So at the on the spectra, at the, right at the end, there are two sections where you know it was an alkyl chain or an aromatic. Yep. Benzene being an aromatic goes to the aromatic zone, and that so oh it's aromatic. You just write down as an aromatic, no problem. And then you've got your other spectra that tells you other things. And essentially this program or this this lovely little website actually goes through and tells you where this what the uh, areas and, and environments are with shifts, patterns, and it usually tells you what multiplets um, 
It is. So this makes this really quite so a this good makes learning it aid. Learning aid in how you can actually sort of, you know, look for. You don't understand. You draw it. Now this is where your drawing skills are useful. And it just allows you just not have a play, but it shows you the reason why things are. It goes through the multiplicity, it goes through, you know, where it is on the spectrum, why it is, and it sort of does show you what, how moving a oxygen around the chain, around the molecule, changes where that peak, because it is that oxygen peak, but changes where it goes in the entire spectrum of the NMR. So for an exam, you're going to be given a question which you're not going to have met before. It'll probably be an NMR you haven't met before. And if you can load up this website, which is nmrdb.org, I don't own it, I wish I did. I'd be making a fortune now. Uh, you can then start to explore some of these NMRs and see what sort of thing happens. So when you come up to the exams you've got a much better idea of what's going to happen absolutely absolutely so let's go and have a look at a proton nmr so, uh, on here so if you want to try and make us a proton nmr so how you go about doing that right so i'm just going to go and clear this this is what it will look like when you blank it right Okay. So we've gone on to the proton NMR So this page. is now proton NMR. Right, you draw out your structure. So let's make a nice chain. And let's, let's put some side chains off. And it has problems of chirality which, which I will solve. Because I forgot how to draw, where to draw what I was doing. Let me just draw some chains. And it's a moan because it likes moaning me. And I think that's because if I do that, it, it, it's happy it's now. It's happy now. It, it's essentially doing it's doing the chemistry on it. Yeah, throw an OH in there for good fun. Ah, I'll put an OH there. Okay. So if we now work out, it's quite a complicated molecule. Quite a complicated molecule. And you look at the spectrum, you go, oh, oh my God, that's quite big. That's quite a lot, but. If you just step through it, you can see, look, there you go. All those has the same environment. Those have the same environment. Those have the same environment. And you sort of say, well, you know. You and it's putting it up down the bottom if you scroll just a little bit up. So we can see that. So as you're selecting the different groups, we can see what groups are causing what sort of things on the spectrum. So. so we can put all those together. Now when we come to do uh, a normal exam question, if there be such a thing as a normal exam question anyway, what a student will normally get basically three things. What they're going to get is simply they'll get uh, a carbon 13 NMR, they'll get a proton NMR, and they'll get an infrared spectrum to have a look at. So, where would you start with this? Well, I've got all three. Where do I actually choose to start when I want to have a look at? something you you start to whatever you're i'd say you're good at whatever you fancy really because essentially all you're doing is finding jigsaw pieces and identifying jigsaw pieces and then once you've got all the jigsaw pieces at the end you can then essentially say right i've now finished laid out them i've made my jigsaw and i've worked out the structure so you start off wherever you want to start off with. You know, you can work out, you can go IR, that tells you what functional groups you've got. So you've got a rather an estimate of what you've got. But at the same time, NMR also tells you what functional groups and where they are and what they're next to. So it's sort of, you know, it's a little bit of one, a little bit of the other. But usually NMR is your last thing due to the fact it tells you what is next door to that atom or that functional group, so you can slowly build up a picture 
that way. So then I put forgot to put one down which is the, the mass spec here. Uh, so if I was doing a problem like this I would probably look at the mass spec first. That will give me an immediate idea of what the molecular weight is going to be of my substance. Then perhaps number two I'm going to look at my infrared and I'm going to work out basically my functional group so I know if I've got an OH for instance or something else. You can look then, out for them, yeah, exactly. And then we could go and have a look at the either proton NMR or the carbon NMR. You, you said you're not really that fussed which one we actually look at next to see what carbons we've got and what hydrogens we've got on those carbons. And then you've got your jigsaw. And now you've got your jigsaw, we've got to start the, the hard bit, which is just basically trying to put it together and make some sense of what we've got. Yes, exactly. It, it, it is a mess. You do get problems. Um, but that is the skill of a, you know, one of the of a analytical chemists is building up these jigsaws and solving the problems. So, you know, it, it's one of these things where there is no way to start, but at the end, you should get a molecule. And if you don't, then you go back and you work out where you went wrong, look at the pixel, change the jigsaw, move it around, flip it upside down, you know, invert it, you know, manipulate it to see if you can actually find it matches the signal. Because you've got to remember that the, all these techniques, they're analysing the same compound, the same thing, the real thing. It can't be this made up thing, you know, infinite imagination. It, can, it is physical, it is real, it only works and only made one way. The good news is that when you try one of these things, if you get an alternative answer, then you may find you'll actually pick up nearly all your marks to do one of these things. So, in today's session we've had a look at NMR, we've looked at that, try and put it together. What we want to do uh, next time is I want to take a look at, I'm just going to get rid of my guest so that he can uh, carry on doing his usual function which is uh, sorting out the editing as we're going along in the production. So what we'll have a look at next time is looking at the full question. So we'll have a look next time at some questions. We'll look at, given some IRs, given some mass spec, given some NMR data, then let's see if we can try and do the detective work. And what I'll do is I'll invite Paul back next time because he is a very good detective at working out what he's got. Usually because he actually knows what he's got and he's trying to prove what he's think he's made is what he's got. Um, because that's what you tend to do more at university than what you do at uh, A level. But we'll take a, a well-known substance and we'll create the infrared, we'll create the NMR and mass spec for these and since I don't have any of these tools we're going to have to cheat and go and get them and that is sometimes causing a few favours and once we've got those we'll try to create a few new problem questions and see if we can then do the detective work and especially if I'm not kind to Paul in that I don't show him what they are beforehand then he can try and solve the jigsaw and go through the problems the way he solves the problem and that should help you identify an unknown substance. So thank you very much for watching I hope you found that useful if you did please subscribe and I'll see you 
back next week to look at some A-level chemistry topic by topic and we'll look at these problems of working out what have we got. Until then, stay safe. Bye-bye.